All right, let's get started. Welcome and thank you for joining CTI Connect in Toronto for part two of our four-part wireside chat series that rode to Wispalooza. Um, part two, we're gonna go over how Toronto's interference cancellation can enhance your network, how you can achieve superior spectral efficiency, and how you can rethink your network design with Toronto's G1 platform. Parts three and four, ROI and scalability will be held at the Wispalooza Masters Monday on October 3rd in the Paris Hotel, Las Vegas. <clears throat> These are a portion of an afternoon event when we will take a deep dive into the secret sauce that makes Toronto G1 a true, true next generation platform. You receive an invitation for this event following this wireside chat. Don't forget to stop by our booths 145 and 149 at Wispalooza. Please use the Q&A section for any questions during the webinar and we will answer them upon completion. Joining us today, we have Kyle Friedis, Distribution Channel Manager and Mo Williams, Senior Manager of Technical Marketing with Toronto. Thank you both for taking the time to speak with us today. I'll pass the screen to you for the presentation. Thanks a lot, Mike. I appreciate everybody's time today. I know everybody has busy schedules, but I hope this is very informative for you. And the focus is on the G1 product. There's a question out there about G2. Uh, we're not talking about G2 today, just G1. So just a quick background for everybody. The product is, contains the base node and the base node is what goes on the tower. Those are the radios you see in the middle of your screen. And then to the left of it are the remote nodes or the residential nodes. And those are the, the radios that go on the side of homes or businesses that of course connect to the base node. To the far right is the Toronto Cloud Suite and that's how you manage the radios. So the full solution are the radios, of course, the accessories and the ability to manage and support all that infrastructure in the field with the TCS, Toronto Cloud Suite. So we're gonna talk about a few things that you see on the left. We're going to talk about reuse of spectrum, K K equals one. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the fundamentals of uh, the products and how they work. And then we'll also talk about how you can rethink your network with those capabilities. So some of the things we're gonna hit today is noise cancellation, multipath, future proofing, frequency reuse of one, efficient deployments, long range connections and compatibility with other operators. Okay, first off, we need to level set a little bit. Clear line of sight means there's no obstructions in the Fresnel zone. So the radios can link without any obstructions, either moving obstructions or permanent static obstructions in, in the path. Near line of sight is when there's objects in the path that obstruct part of the Fresnel zone, but is not a complete obstruction between the link the radios. And then non-line of sight is when the radios, if you were optically looking at them, you couldn't see the other side, you couldn't see the other radio because there's something obviously in front of them that's permanent, it's not moving, and it's uh, pretty, uh, pretty big to obstruct the full Fresnel zone. Okay. Now, Toronto can deal with all three of these, and we'll talk about these as we move through the discussion. One of the ways we're able to deal with uh, obstructions in the field between the two radios is with reflection, actually bouncing the signal off of hard surfaces and allowing it to be sent or with a different path, a multipath, um, to the remote node or the base node, whichever direction it's flowing in. And it can be reconstructed and it can be reconstructed extremely well to provide a very, very good connection that allows for non line of sight or near line of sight. We can also deal with diffraction, which is the ability of radio waves to curve around objects. And here again, we can reconstitute the signal on the other side. The benefit of the Toronto radios is they're we're optimizing the signal on both sides, on the base node that goes on the tower and the residential remote node that goes on the homeowner resident um, or the businesses. <clears throat> By reassembling these multipath radio waves and all the energy, it provides a really, really strong signal that we can take advantage of these uh, multipath that we're going around or over or reflecting off of um, different objects. So we're able to do beam forming. And with the beam forming, we can do it on both ends, on the remote side, the RN side, and the base node side. 
And because the environment may change because of movable objects or seasonal activities with the trees regaining their leaves and things uh, like weather affecting you know, the leaf structure and what's on the leaves and all those kinds of things, it changes the path. And because of that, we're able to make adaption, adoption or adaption of the environment. And we're signaling or sensing, sorry, uh, 5,000 5, times a second to optimize the signal path based upon the current environment. So we're constantly sensing and sampling the environment between the base node and the remote node and optimizing the best path for the best signal to provide the best connection. So on the left hand side, you can see where it's there's you can't see the radios if you're on one side, you couldn't see the other side, you're going through foliage, maybe there's objects like buildings or what have you. Um, and in the middle, there's some near line of sight issues, uh, some foliage that you can see the radios, but there's obstructions uh, between the two. And of course, on the right is a long shot. 11 and a half kilometer shot in which you have clear line of sight. So we can handle all three environments. Now, noise cancellation, we're able to do with two things. One is beam forming. So we're actually able to shape the beam and direct the energy where we need it to go to connect to the RNs. The other thing is we have a technology called ABIC, Adaptive Burst Interference Cancellation. And with that, we're able to remove or sorry cancel the noise that's in the environment that we're trying to operate and so we're able with beam forming to direct the energy where we need it to go and also to null put in nulls where we don't want to receive interference energy from a competing uh, provider or somebody else that's operating in the area and then with abec we're able to uh, provide a connection in a really, really noisy environment where you have bursty um, interference that is going on, okay? So here's an example of multipath and beam forming. So we're able to direct the energy where it needs to go based upon the best path, the multipath, um, where it's going to be able to connect to that remote node. And here again, we can deal with moving objects such as the yellow bus in the middle of the picture there. Whereas, you know, at one point, the best path is maybe the left side of those three beams that are going across the bus. But as the bus moves through that field, um, obviously that beam is not as good anymore and then it'll change to a different path. So that's part of the benefits of having beam forming and being able to manage multi-path signals and reconstruct the best signal at the house where it's ricocheted off of multiple objects such as other homes in order to connect to the customer that has the RN on the side of the house. Okay, so this enables us to do non-line of sight and near line of sight connections to customers that are normally not able to be connected to a tower because they required in the past with other technologies line of sight, but we can handle that. Okay, so here's some examples <clears throat> of high bandwidth uh, customers that are connected, even though they have obstructions, not line of sight, near line of sight issues. On the left-hand side, this is a customer down in Texas, Resound Networks. In this example, they have one BN, so they have one 90 degree sector base node on a tower. They're connecting over 130 RNs in that 90 degree sector. And 91% of those customers that they can connect and address and um, provide service to are able to be provided over 400 megabits of download speed. And this is a five gig solution here. Some of those links go out to about 4.4 kilometers from the base node. In the example on the right, this is Whisper, and they're out of Missouri, but they have services in four other states. 82% um, of the links can do 400 meg or better on the download. And uh, this is an example where they have some long connections. This one is the furthest one in this example off of one base node is 18.4 uh, kilometers. So as you can see by this example, these examples, you can deal with dense customers in one sector. So that's one radio on a tower. 
and they're able to connect with customers that have non-line of sight issues, near line of sight issues, and long range distance connection requirements as well. Okay, moving on. This is an example of CBRS, the three gigahertz product. And this is just an example in one location off the same tower in the same direction. What kind of comparative uh, opportunities can you connect customers? So on the left-hand side, Tirana with our CBRS three gig solution. And you can see the red, if you look at the legend on the right, you can see that the uh, red areas, they can provide, you know, better connectivity, higher performance. And then <clears throat> as you go further away from the tower, uh, you can still provide connections and provide services, 100 megabits, maybe address more customers, provide better coverage, and higher customer speeds, longer range, and more customers connected. So that's what this is all explaining to you. So with that, you need to start thinking about how you would deploy this product differently and how you can save costs by engineering it differently and supporting clients where you could never support them or provide services in the past. This is an example of a single 90 degree base node on a tower in San Jose. And as you know, or you probably know, is that it's a really, really noisy environment. And this example, the service provider was able to provide really high speed connections. You can see the red and the orange is 650 meg, 500 meg, and even into the dark blue and the purple, they can still provide 100 megabit or 50 megabit uh, services, uh, download speeds. Uh, they can provide you know, longer range connections. You can see the curve, the blue line out to 15 kilometers. You can connect a lot of customers. And this is all from one sector on one tower. So think if you added more tower you know, perspectives and did a 360 degree coverage on that tower, that's a lot of customers. Every sector we can provide coverage for up to 254 customers per sector. So think about a thousand customers can be serviced off of one tower with four base nodes. Okay, so dense coverage. <clears throat> we can handle um, coverage in a metro area or a rural area and the minimum inter-site distance is about 400 meters. Now there's some things you have to consider with that design and that topology, but essentially that's, that's a good general guidance for the shortest distance that you could have towers where we're operating. But because of um, beam forming and nulling and all the other things that we provide, <clears throat> we can operate in this environment and not interfere with ourselves. And that's the example on the right-hand side where we can reuse the spectrum um, and interoperate with other providers or a single provider in an area where normally they'd be interfering because the radios are pointing in the same similar direction. So this allows you a denser cell coverage solution if needed, and it allows you to operate in areas where other Toronto radios are operating currently or in the future. So with the ability to manage heavy interference, you should rethink your network design. Every tower, every sector on that tower can now be considered for base nodes. The towers that overlap coverage to connect customers should be considered, right? So you can have coverage from different directions or provide uh, you know, more connectivity to customers in that area. So if you had a sector that needed more than 250 customers, you could provide that solution for 300, 400, 500 plus customers. Customers can be connected where, you know, in the past it wasn't feasible because of non-line of sight, near line of sight issues, and we can address those now. And also consider longer range distances off some of your existing towers or maybe other towers that provides you better coverage to the edge of your service offering area in your different regions that you provide support. A couple of case studies. The first one is a Resound. So they had 
<clears throat> the ability to deploy fixed wireless uh, in the southeast of Texas, you can see their area of coverage down there, San Antonio, Austin, Houston, and Corpus Christi. And what they found is that they had a 40% reduction in the number of towers required for full coverage in their area. They also found that there was 50% reduction in installation complexity and time per tower, meaning the number of radios that they had to put up on the tower was either three or four base nodes. And that was a reduction in just total time, effort, cost to do all those installations. They saw a 50% reduction in overall deployment schedule. So as they pushed out into those regions and lit up those towers and then deployed into the residential areas, they were saving an enormous amount of time, half the time that they had planned on doing their rollouts and their uh, uh, service uh, introductions into Greenfield's new markets. They saw greater than three times uh, uh, real world and subscriber speeds and supporting up to one gigabit uh, plans for some of the customers. Uh, what we recommend is the advertising 600 meg plus, um, but certainly customers can get higher than 600 megs. Um, they had a rapid full scale marketing effort into these large suburban areas. And it was possible because they knew they could address that market with pre-planning with the Google Network Planner that uh, is available for everybody to use. Um, they were able to figure out which markets they could cover and which neighborhoods and, and the addresses and, and complement that with their marketing initiatives. And it's just a substantial reduction in network maintenance and customer support that was required in these areas that they delivered uh, Tirana. Here's an example of a side-by-side -side comparison. It's a generic, but a real example. So if you had the requirement to provide 1600 subscribers in a 20 kilometer square kilometer area, and you needed about 200 subscribers per sector at a minimum of 100 download, 200 meg upload service, um, what would it take uh, for the towers? So with the Toronto example, uh, you could do two towers, four sectors per tower, okay? And you could offer plans that were uh, above 500 megabits if you wanted um, with uh, uh, download speeds, and then upload speeds uh, over 100 megabits if that's what was required uh, with the service offering of this service provider. The alternative is the number of subscribers per sector is probably closer to 40 or less, and the number of towers requ required to cover the same geographical area and provide at least 100 by 220 megabit service was greater than 10 towers required for the same coverage in that area. So that's, you're starting to understand the differences hopefully between what's required in the base nodes and what goes on the tower. But with that, you can have a much denser deployment of customers that can be serviced off of those fewer towers. Okay, here's a quick example of the economics of three different environments. The urban is on the left, suburban in the middle, and the rural on the right. And you can, the household densities, you can see 2,000 for, per square kilometer in the metro areas, uh, 800 in the suburban areas, and 30 in the rural areas. The spectrum is either five or CBRS, five and six gig, or CBRS, I should say. And you can see the number of households passed um, that can be covered by that, that deployment. Um, the cost for household pass, uh, $4, $5, and $10 respectively. And the target penetration was to get up to 10% coverage of customers in that area that would take the service. And in the case of the suburban, up to 25% and the rural 50%. And with that, would be different packages that would be provided at in the suburban or urban environment, like $50 packages, and then rural would be $70 or more. Um, the internal rate of return, as you can see at the bottom, is greater than 80%. 
for these different solutions and these different business models. So hopefully this gives you an idea of that you can cover, you know, suburban areas where there's a lot of homes, but there's obstructions near line of sight, not a lot of sight issues. And certainly in the urban areas, you have a lot of customers, um, but you can take advantage of that multipath and provide good service in an area that just cannot be served with other technologies today. Okay, this example, just uh, the blue line is the Toronto and the bottom gray line is fiber. So if you can get fiber, great, right? But the challenges are the time it takes for it to get trenched and deployed and lit up and connected and all those kind of things is, just takes a while. So with service providers that realize, you know, having a mix is great, having a hybrid network, of course, with fiber and uh, fixed wireless uh, is, very beneficial, um, but the big advantage you have is that you can deploy the fixed wireless much faster and gain revenue much quicker. And therefore it helps with, you know, the financials of your company and the fact that you can um, uh, service customers and, you know, retain those customers in your geographical area and not have somebody overbuild on top of you. In the meantime, while you're waiting for fiber, great. You have revenue, you, it's a fungible asset. You can relocate the Toronto products if you, if you so deem in the future, but realize you can provide the same performance and speeds over time because Toronto can be upgraded with software to increase the port speeds of the remote nodes that are attached to the residential sites. Okay, so given that with the ability to use fewer base stations, it reduces you know, the, the cost on the tower and what you have to build on the tower. And then you should start thinking strategically about which towers I would select in order to provide the best overlay and provide the best performance in order to provide the best service offering and the highest ARPU for those packages, like 100, 100 megabit service or 400 megabit service for businesses or whatever that is. So with network planning, it provides a more flexible and scalable solution. And with that, you should rethink the design and how to deploy. Now, our sales engineers and our team can help with this. We can show you how to do it. Um, <clears throat> the good thing about CTI is they have a technical accredited trainer on their staff, just like Mo Williams is on our team. And uh, they, they can help you with the design work and trying to figure out the best planning before you actually uh, make purchases. Now, the other aspect of the Toronto product, we talked about this briefly, is just that you can increase the port speeds on the remote nodes. They are shipped at 50 megabits per second, and you can upgrade them to 100, 200, or 600 plus megabits. Now these radios will go up to 800, but what we provide and what we encourage and what we uh, state is that uh, this the upgrade will do at least 600 uh, based upon you know performance of the link in that that specific area. But you you will know what the the radios can do in that area because when you turn them on, you can actually do the uh, speed test and figure out what's available. So it should match your. Google network planning um, that you had pr done prior to deployment. Okay, so how do you rethink that component into it? Fewer radios on the tower, less radio maintenance, less leasing costs to install and maintain radios on the towers, fewer people to manage the spectrum because you're not gonna deal with interference issues um, where you're you know, knocking each other out or knocking your own network out with interference. <clears throat> you can think differently and plan differently. Um, the longer life cycle of the RNs is based upon your ability to upgrade those remote nodes with software to increase performance and therefore reduce the number of truck rolls to customers. The higher density of customers in those sectors off that base node um, means the concentration of field support, meaning you can cover that area with a lot more customers that can be provided the service and therefore you can support it in a much more dense area with your field technicians. The higher revenue per tower, of course, too, because you have more customers working connected to that base node. 
So deploying Tron is faster than connecting fiber to the homes. It's the fastest path to revenue uh, with fiber-like uh, service offerings to your clients. And of course you can grow those over time. So we talked about a few of these things today. I think we covered them all actually. Um, we talked about noise cancellation with the ability to do beam forming on the base node and the residential node, you optimize the connections to deal with non-line of sight, near line of sight. We actually create nulls in the beams uh, to reduce energy where we don't want to transmit. So we aren't polluting the spectrum where we, we're not going to connect to a remote node. And also we're not going to listen in that area either. So by doing so, we're able to cancel out the noise. And with the adaptive burst interference canceller, canceller ABIC, we can improve performance too, where other radios just can't deal with the interference. Multipath, here again, we're bouncing signals off of solid surfaces to operate in that NLS and non-line of sight, near line of sight environments. Future proofing with the software updates, so the performance, the speeds, uh, frequency use, reuse of one uh, with full uh, order modulation allows us, you know, deployments across many towers where we won't interfere with ourselves. So a service provider won't interfere with themselves and their own radios and then won't interfere with others that are operating on those, those towers too. Efficient deployment, high density customer delivery here again, up to a thousand customers off a single tower with four base nodes on that tower. We can support longer range connections as we talked about earlier, uh, seven miles for customer connections, line of sight, two to three miles for near line of sight customers. You know, it depends on terrain and the obstacles that are in the way. And here again, we're compatible with other operators. So we have radios that are working on towers that um, other providers didn't realize that we, our customers, our service providers had actually light, lit off the, uh, the radios and they're operating and they didn't realize that they were because we weren't interfering with others. So that's another benefit of uh, being able to coexist and not create problems when it's deployed. So here's you know, the look of the remote nodes on the left-hand side and the base nodes, of course, in the center there. And we talked about all these, these uh, pieces uh, and features and capabilities. And uh, just these are the things you wanna consider when you're rethinking your network design and planning how you're going to deploy. And also think about you know, the marketing effort and identifying which of the best neighborhoods and best cell towers to operate off of or water tanks or, you know, structures that you can emanate off of a building to provide the best service for the highest density number of customers uh, that are willing to pay the most for these packages that you would offer. Okay. All right, we're at questions. So uh, we're gonna go to QA now. All right, okay. So for the dense coverage example, is that showing the same frequency channel? Uh, yes, it is for the base nodes. Um, do those costs label as cost per household include support costs or is that just the hardware cost? Uh, it's the hardware cost um, and it's based upon some nominal installation fees. And I don't know the exact number that we used in those models. Um, what Mike Hopridge talked about is on Monday at Wispalooza uh, between one and five o'clock, there's the CTI symposium. We're going to go through the business case model, which is a spreadsheet with some assumptions and slideware as well. But uh, we will share with you that cost model and that cost structure that we came up with all those numbers. So if you're able to attend um, Wispalooza on Monday in the afternoon in the bronze one room, uh, we will go through all that in detail. And then we'll certainly sit down with you and, and go through it in more detail if, if that's what's needed. Okay. Um, why do you use this model for subscription? Why don't you just give us the units opened up? Okay. <clears throat> So the differentiation of the port speed upgrade is that you can allow your customers 
uh, to have a differentiated model, right? Adding more value to your clients where it makes a lot of sense. Um, to be quite frank, the remote nodes, there's not a lot of margin in it for us right now, making our ends. And this is a way that we can provide the least expensive base model of the RN um, for those that are fine with 50 megabits. Um, in time, we hope to reduce the cost of our RNs and improve our margins, but we're not even close there yet. Um, so that's the reason for that. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, if you buy a license for 100 megabits and need to change that to 600, um, it basically you would pay for the upgrade from 50 to 100, okay? And then if you're going to go from the 100 up to 600, you would pay for that additional amount to go up to 600. Uh, if, as, if it met on the annual fee or the three-year fee, of course, then you just pay for that 50 to 600 meg upgrade. Um, the, the discounts that you need to talk to CTI about because the discounts are related to uh, volume purchases and, and things like that. So you really need to talk pricing with CTI as far as discounting and things yeah, like and that. And we can help you price anything out you need. We can get you to a sales rep if you don't already have one. So yeah, absolutely. Just let us know if you want a quote. We can, we can get that to you right away. Yeah. Uh, do you know the number of years using the IRR um, um, for the 80%? Uh, I do not know, but I believe it was seven years. Um, but here again, when we peel apart the business model on Monday at uh, Wispalooza, mm -hmm. we'll have all the assumptions associated with those as well. Okay. Um, the question was, can you provide a ballpark in the support cost per model? Um, as far as, I'm not sure what that means, if that means installation support and then follow-on support. Um, usually these radios, the RNs, assuming that no structure has to be installed at the client's house, meaning there's no tower or no structure that goes on a roof or anything like that. Assuming it attaches to some part of the house, um, then the installation costs are usually uh, max two hours on site, and that's start to finish. Um, if there's structure required, that's a lot more. Let's just be frank. Um, and then after that, there's no reason to roll a truck as long as the equipment is not damaged due to natural causes or some weird thing. Um, and then the, there is a month, excuse me, there is an annual software maintenance support license that's an annual fee. And that goes with the radios. And it depends on, you know, the number of years you buy up front and all that kind of stuff. Here again, CTI can quote all that for you. Yeah, and, and the SMS keys, as, as Kyle's referring to, uh, they are for the use of TCS. So that's your, your, your mobile web-based NMS system, your platform where you can do your upgrades from and you can get a look at where all your RNs are, how they're performing, how your BNs are performing. So that fee is really an NMS fee if you want to think about it in terms of what you're paying for that's what that service fee is. And, and honestly, it's, you get quite a lot for the nominal fee. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mo, have a question for you. What is the maximum distance for an RN to connect to a BN? So can you yeah, talk about- Yeah, I, I started to type the answer to that, but actually there were a few kind of things that I wanted to, to touch on. Um, so first of all, that there's a parameter uh, called network profile that can be set on a, it, it can be set globally for your network and then you can do it on a, a, a per site basis. Um, you wanna make sure that that parameter, the network profile is the same for all um, BNs and sectors that can hear each other um, because that sets the TDD timing. Um, and right now the profiles, the, mostly what that changes, the, the, the three profiles that we support is the ratio of downlink to uplink um, but it also sets the maximum distance, the, the, the maximum uh, distance from an RN to a, to its BN is 15 kilometers. We do have another network profile that is um, being tri trialed live um, that will extend that. Um, but you, uh, it's more it's mostly important that you have all of your BNs um, uh, 
th that are that can hear each other be at the same time so it could be, uh, be on the same setting so that you're not stepping on each other um, with your timing oh uh, and if that didn't help then you can email me at mo at toronto wireless and i will get you a better answer okay thanks mo uh do we have to re-up the port speed subscription so once we buy it it's not ours uh the the answer is yes, you have to have a continual subscription for the port speeds if you're going to have something more than 50 megabits and you can buy it in one, three and five year terms. In the side-by-side -side comparison where we compared 1600 subs with speeds of 500 uh, by 110, is that, the is that the speed all subs can get or just a percentage? Uh, it actually varies, right? Because you have different customers that can achieve higher performance based upon connectivity issues, non line of sight, near line of sight, what have you, and distance and whatever. Um, so it's not, you know, we're ac actually able to provide higher performance to more customers uh, in those examples. But what we wanted to do was provide at, at least coverage for 100 megabits download and 20 megabits upload minimum for those customers. That was the comparison one, one for one. But what we can do is provide higher speeds. And yes, a lot of the customers, it was a mix of 100, 200, probably 400, 500 meg and higher was the Toronto side of it. Okay, what happens to the BNs and RNs if they no longer pay for support? So if you do not continue your SMS license, um, you'll get notification and warning. Will they continue to operate? Yes, they will continue to operate, but they'll be de de downgraded in speed um, until you can clear you know, the, that you have a license and you're, you're gonna continue to operate. Um, it's pretty, those, the licenses are pretty inexpensive. And um, here again, CTI resells those. Uh, do the radios have GPS? Yes, they do. No, they don't. Uh, on the BNs? And the question is for the RN. Oh, I'm Does sorry. The RN have, to have a GPS. Okay, I stand corrected. Thanks, Mo. Yeah, so on the RN, when you uh, do the installation, um, you will um, provision the latitude, longitude, height, azimuth, and tilt. Um, on the on the RN, and as the next question down um, about the CPI, uh, that's very important, of course, on the on the CBRS units. Okay, go ahead. Why don't you answer that, Mo, and I'll jump back to the other one. Actually, um, I'm going to need a clarification about what CPI remote signing is because this is uh, it's, everything's remote. You're just you're logged into the. Um, uh, to the web UI and the um, and, and TCS. So when the C, when the CPI installs the RN, um, the parameters are configured on through the web uh, through the web UI, and the CPI um, installs his certificate or uploads his certificate information um, on that. And then through TCS, that's should that part actually is already done uh, through TCS. So um, and so at the time that the RN um, gets configured. Okay. Hang on, I'm th I'm at, I'm walking my way I'm, I'm walking my way through that one. Um, so it, I, I'm I'm guessing that the um, that that app um, that's coming out is going to answer that question. The 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 um, the phone app for configuration. Um. Yes. Okay, Alex, is. I have completely mangled the answer that you were looking for. So once again, um, if, uh, ping me at Mo at Toronto Wireless so that I have your, your contact information. I will get you the answer that you deserved. I apologize. Yeah. Okay. Um, are the support fees based upon a flat rate or number of subs? It's based upon the number of RNs you have in the field. So you need the SMS license to have coverage for all your remote nodes out there. And the SMS license is only for your remote nodes. Now, what do you get with that? You get access to TCS, the Toronto Cloud Suite, where you manage all the 
uh, equipment, you have all the alarms, you can see all the performance. Um, and of course you can do all the provisioning there. Uh, the next is you get access to all the upgrades, the software upgrades for all the radios that you have deployed. Um, the other part of it is 24 by seven support that you will get a hold of a technical person that one can either answer the question, number two, assign a ticket and escalate it if they aren't able to resolve it. Um, so if there's major outages, we're gonna stay on the phone with you, work through the issues. And of course you get access to the back uh, office engineers if it's a really challenging problem we've never seen before. So that's all part of the SMS license uh, that's included in that. And that's here again, just for the remote nodes. Okay. All right. Um, I think we have time for one more. Yeah, Alex had a full on piece of that most. So maybe just maybe send the reply back. Okay. I'm doing that right now. Okay, great. All right. Uh, Okay, uh, does support include assistance for BDC filings? Mo, do you have the answer for that one? That's a really good question. I know that we do uh, uh, help uh, with RFPs. BDC, I do not know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. But once again, Mr. Anonymous, I am Mo. And if you, I will, I will follow up with you if you give, uh, send me an email. Or if you're going to provide your contact information in the Q and A, we can get back to you with that. Okay, Mike. Thanks. Thanks so much. Great. Well, we appreciate everybody's time. Uh, thank you, Kyle and Mo. And um, you know, don't forget if you're going to be at Wispet to stop by our booths, 145 and 149. And uh, everybody on this webinar and. In, Anyone who was on the previous webinar will get an invitation to the Monday event that uh, really goes over ROI and uh, Transector will be there to go over best practices for uh, DC and POE surge protection, as well as a, a finance partner, Stefan of Capital, to talk about um, building your network better with Toronto. So uh, again, thanks everyone. And um, we'll see you at Wispalooza. Thank you.